Good day and welcome to Of Many Things. Uh, I'm Father Matt Malone. I'm the editor-in-chief of America Magazine. Uh, this spring marks the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. And the United States emerged from that conflict as one of two global superpowers and as a champion of international institutions. For the next 75 years, uh, there were misadventures in places like Vietnam and elsewhere, but there was a broad public consensus that the United States has a vital, almost indispensable role to play in international affairs, and it could no longer afford the luxury of isolationism. Today, that consensus is being called into question from a variety of forces. And here to talk about that, um, the history of the last 75 years and the way forward uh, is Ambassador R. Nicholas Burns, who is professor of the practice of diplomacy and international politics at Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government and a member of the board of directors of the school's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. Ambassador, thanks so much for being with us. Father Malone, thanks so much for having me on. I'm a great admirer of America Magazine and of you. And so oh, thank you. Really thank you very much. I should also say we're doing this on President Kennedy's 103rd birthday, uh, what would have been wow. his 103rd birthday, so which seems That's appropriate. Exactly right, it does. Um, I, I suppose where I'd like to start is, uh, you know, that this period since the Second World War, it's often described by historians as the American century, when America really uh, emerged as a global power and the leader of the free world during the Cold War. Uh, what, in your mind, is the enduring lesson of that period? The enduring lesson of the last 75 years is that, is that the United States has to be in the world, engaged in the world, leading in the world by virtue of the power we exert in the world. And I would also say, Matt, by virtue of the principles of the founding of the country that we want to produce, help build a world that is uh, prosperous, that is peaceful, and that is just. And the big development 75 years ago is that the United States did emerge as the most powerful country after the terrible conflagration of the Second World War the bitter lesson that we learned, we lost so many soldiers in the Second World War, is that America can never again be isolationist. I never, America has to be uh, involved in all the positive aspects of global life, like ending poverty. And there's been a lot of uh, progress made on that um, by dealing with um, global disease, and that we have to be involved in helping to avoid future world wars. Uh, that was FDR's lesson. That was Harry Truman's lesson. That was Eleanor Roosevelt's lesson. That was Dean Acheson's lesson. Uh, and the world worked well, at least better, when the United States was fully engaged throughout the Cold War after 9-11. No question about it. But now we're in a time when the United States seems to, at least our government, forgotten some of those lessons, those very important lessons from the Second World War. Right. And there were obvious missteps in, in, in that history, but there Certainly. It, it was almost inconceivable uh, that the United States would somehow retreat from the world, that we would return to a period of isolationism like we saw after the First World War uh, and prior to, to 1941. Uh, we, we're living in a time now uh, where we have a president who says, let's make, let's make America great again, and uh, and, and, and really is in retreat from many of its commitments throughout the world. And he's supported by a substantial number of Americans. What, what do you think accounts for that, that, that feeling that, we, that America's doing too much in the world, that we need to retreat from the world and, and take care of problems here at home? What, what do you think, think accounts they, for that as a force in our national life right now? Matt, I think it's ahistorical. Um, that the government right now in, is being led by a, a president, President Donald Trump, who really has, it seems, little appreciation for the brief history that you and I have just recounted. And I was struck by what you said. Uh, it seemed inevitable that Americans after 1945 would never go back to Lindbergh, would never go back to America first, would never go back to restricting uh, immigrants from coming into this country based on religion as we did in the 1930s, so shamefully in keeping Jewish refugees out of the United States. Many of them then ended up in death camps uh, in places like Auschwitz. But we're doing the same thing now in applying a religious means test, keeping Muslims out of the United States. The president seems 
to have no sense of that history, no sense of the bitter lessons that we've learned. And he is a, an avowed unilateralist. He believes the United States is better off acting alone in the world. He doesn't believe as I do, but more importantly, I think every senior member of the Congress seems to be, uh, believe, and that is we're better off acting with allies and partners. Another lesson of the Second World War that FDR ingrained in us, that the United States cannot go alone despite our extraordinary power in the world. In, in 2020, we can't fight the pandemic without 194 countries helping us to do that. We certainly can't make any progress on climate change if we try to act alone. And to see the president disavow NATO, disavow our East Asian alliances, become a virulent critic of the European Union, it's ahistorical, it's ignorant, and it's leading to a weakening of the United States, I'm sorry to say, around the world. And it is a historical in terms of the history of the United States over the, the last century, uh, but it's also not, it, it, it's not, you know, the kind of isolationism or nationalism, uh, unilateralism, whatever you want to call it, that, that, that President Trump is bringing to our national politics. We're seeing that elsewhere too, aren't we? In other parts of the world, in Eastern Europe, uh, the sort of the emergence of a, of a, of a, new, a new kind of nationalism. We're certainly seeing the rise of nationalism again. Um, we saw it in the 1930s with Tojo uh, in Japan, with Hitler and Mussolini in Europe. I'm not comparing anybody on the world stage right now to Hitler and Mussolini, but we're seeing virulent nationalism in places like Hungary combined with authoritarianism. Democracy is being extinguished in Hungary, unfortunately, a NATO and EU member. We're seeing uh, Turkish nationalism and a combination of authoritarianism in the person of President Erdogan in Turkey. We're certainly seeing, look just this week at the events in Beijing, at the People's Assembly that was held, Chinese nationalism under Xi Jinping, the nation above all else, China um, now taking steps to limit and probably extinguish democracy and the rule of law in Hong Kong, China acting in a very aggressive way towards its neighbors competitors for the islands and islets of the South and East China Sea. We're seeing nationalism in the United States. Uh, we're seeing elements of really ugly white nationalism that is a plague to us. And I think that Donald Trump is also an American nationalist in the way he works, looks at the world. I, I would say, Matt, and I tell my students this, there's nothing wrong with being patriotic. In fact, we should be patriotic. I, I love the United States and I know you do too. That's being patriotic, standing and um, saluting the flag at the beginning of a baseball game at Fenway Park in Boston is patriotic. But believing that we're somehow better than other people and so much better that we might be able to dominate them, that's, that's Xi Jinping in Chinese nationalism. That's Vladimir Putin in Russian nationalism. In an ignorant sort of way, it's the blissful, uncaring attitude that Donald Trump is exhibiting towards uh, the rest of the world in the pandemic where we really haven't lifted a finger to help anybody else around the world at a time of, of great human need. Yeah. I, what, what do you think accounts for the emergence of this new nationalism here in the U.S. And, and around the world? I mean, some people say that it's kind of a delayed response to the crisis of 2008. Uh, some, some people say that it's, it's in part uh, the, the, the fact that the, the world has gotten smaller as a bolt as a result of globalization and emerging technology. What, what, are, the, what are the factors that, that you look to in accounting for uh, the reemergence of these forces? In many of these countries that, that we've, we've talked about, uh, nationalism is really an excuse for authoritarianism. It's a way to gain control. It's a way to take rights away from people. That's certainly what's been happening in China on the case of Hong Kong and what China hopes to do against Taiwan. It's definitely the case in Russia where Putin has been cracking down even on the few civil liberties that, have, that, that, can, that exist uh, for the Russian population. It's the excuse that, that Viktor Orban is making in Hungary, the leader of Hungary. He's really an authoritarian leader, but he's using this false pride, Hungarian nationalism, as a way to justify the decisions that he's making. And in Western Europe, Angela Merkel is not a German nationalist. And Emmanuel Macron is not a French nationalist. And in, here in North America, Justin Trudeau is not a Canadian mat, a nationalist. They're Democrats. They believe in human freedom and a democratic system. Who are the people resisting that? It's the right-wing anti-democratic populists like Marine Le Pen in France, an alternative for Deutschland 
uh, a major political party now at the extreme right contesting Merkel and the true Democrats in Germany. And so the real fight of our time is that for those of us who live in democracies, defend democracy in our own countries from those who would take democracy and rights away from people. That's Merkel's fight and Macron's fight in Germany and France. That's the fight in Hong Kong. And I do think there's a coincidence of interest among um, the authoritarian figures around the world uh, becoming nationalist as a way to excuse themselves for power grabs. Has the has the the emergence of Donald Trump in the United States and his uh, unilateralism had the indirect effect of uniting uh, some of the multilateralists who are in leadership elsewhere in Europe, like uh, Merkel and Macron? Well, I do think that they're, they feel alone. Um, our NATO allies, and you mentioned two of them, Germany and France, have come to depend on the United States, depend on our word and our credibility and our belief in democracy, that, that, that we'll act consistent to those values in a way that will help them. They've depended on us for 75 years since the end of the Second World War, and suddenly there's an American president who never speaks up on behalf of democracy and human rights and human freedom. He's not made a single statement, Matt, in the last 10 days himself that would show any degree of sympathy for the people of Hong Kong or avow the principle, stand up for the principle of human freedom. Ronald Reagan would have been a stalwart defender of the people of Hong Kong at this moment. He would have been a stalwart defender of the Hungarian people and the Turkish people. John F. Kennedy would have fought that same ideological fight. And Donald Trump seems not to care. He doesn't value it. He values trade. He values obviously military issues, but he doesn't seem to value the principles that we stand for around the world. And I think that's what people, that's what our allies miss uh, in American leadership they, these days. They need help. They need a friend. They need the powerful voice of the American president, and they don't have it. It's another reason why I'm an avowed opponent of Donald Trump, and I hope that we can defeat him at the ballot box on November 3rd. Yeah, and I think we are just really beginning to, to recognize what a profound rupture this, uh, the, the events of the last three and a half, four years have caused, uh, in, has caused in our relationships with, with our allies our partners throughout the world. And we're, we're seeing it, aren't we, in the, in the midst of this global pandemic? Uh, you know, if there was a time when we need our international institutions to, to have a robust and coordinated response to uh, an international emergency, this is it, right? I agree wholeheartedly. It is that time. Now, having said that, I just want to say to those listening, it makes perfect sense that in a pandemic like this, the American president, the governor of New York, the governor of Massachusetts would turn inward first. And our, our first job is to help people in the hospitals and health clinics and the nursing homes and veterans homes. So it made sense that our primary overwhelming focus was on America and on you know, the many, many Americans who've died uh, in this crisis and on the ill. But there's also an international dimension of what we need to do to be true to our principles, to do the right thing to help others, but also because it's the smart thing to help ourselves. So what President Trump should have done, in addition to domestic efforts, uh, was to work globally on the search for a vaccine with China, with India, with the Europeans, the other major economies of the world. We need to figure out if a vaccine is, is actually developed and is safe how can you distribute it equitably among 7.7 .7 billion people in the world so that the poor aren't last in line? We need to figure out a way to get the epidemiologists together on a daily basis to model the disease, and President Trump failed to do that. He didn't use the G20, and we could have led that effort, or the, this is the 20 largest economies in the world. President Bush did that, George W. Bush, at the beginning of the Great Recession in 2008. He called the G20 together. They acted as one. And that helped prevent a Great Depression back in 2008. President Obama did the same thing. President Trump has not done that. And in addition to not leading in that very practical way, one of my European students mentioned to me at the height of the crisis in the United States, he said, you know, in addition to not acting internationally, he said, in all those endless press conferences that your president is giving, not a word of sympathy for the, for the people dying in the hospitals of Italy and of Spain. I was really struck by that. That leadership is many things, 
it, it can be economic. It could be doing the right thing militarily. It's also um, leading as a moral, in a moral sense. And I know that, Matt, Father Malone, you will appreciate this because this is at the center of your mission in the Catholic Church, in the Jesuit Order, in America Magazine. How can we be good moral leaders? People look up to the United States and the American president, and they don't look up to President Trump. Look at his credibility ratings all around the world, plummeting, and ours with him because we look selfish to the rest of the world. So as we look ahead, uh, presuming that the president uh, is, is not reelected and the country returns to sort of the, uh, the status quo ante, uh, we assume a more internationalist uh, uh, orientation to the world. What, what are we going to need to do to repair this situation, to, uh, to repair our relationships to, uh, to reconstruct our in international institutions? Well, I think we should first elect Joe Biden on November 3rd. I, I did not come on your, your program today to, to be unduly partisan, but the conversation has taken us right to that central issue. This is the most important election of our lifetimes. And the whole future of America, I think, depends on the result. Uh, I've known uh, Vice President Biden for many decades, and he's a good person of strong and deep character. Um, and he believes in the moral leadership of the United States. He's been talking about the fact that we really need to recover the soul of America. So I think first and foremost, Matt, the United States needs to show the rest of the world that we're in it with them, that we'll be in it with them on climate change, that we're gonna help to do our part as we can on the pandemic and the global economic collapse. It's really that moral leadership that President Reagan had and President Obama had, and George W. Bush had after 9-11 that was so attractive about the United States, and it has always been attractive about our country. We gotta do that. We have to go back to our alliances. They make us stronger. I have a fundamental disagreement with President Trump. He thinks alliances weaken us. I think they strengthen us, and they do strengthen us. I was ambassador to NATO on 9-11, the American ambassador, and when we were hit very hard and 3,000 of our people were killed in New York and in Pennsylvania and Washington, uh, the NATO allies came my, to me, the, my phone started ringing, what can we do to help? By the next morning, they'd all pledged to go into Afghanistan with us. You can't buy that kind of friendship in the world these days. We have those kinds of friends in NATO and in East Asia. So go back to alliances, dive back into the climate change problem not be the only country in the world outside of the climate change agreement. These are elementary things. I think they would quickly enable us to recover some of our lost credibility. And this is not just to be charitable to the rest of the world. Being charitable is important. Uh, I'm Catholic. I learned that uh, in my youth, uh, the, the, the fact that we have a social obligation as Catholics to do well and to do good. It's also in the self-interest of America. We're stronger. Right. if we're acting with others around the world. Right. Uh, Ambassador Nicholas Burns is the professor of the practice of diplomacy at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Ambassador, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for your contributions to America Magazine. Thank you, Father Malone, and thank you for everything you're doing and, and, for, and for the great gift of America Magazine to everybody who reads it. Thank you. Thank you. And go Red Sox. And go Red Sox, absolutely. <laughs> um, Ambassador Burns is also a graduate of Boston College and, uh, and from Massachusetts and, like me, a Red Sox fan. So, uh, as Moses said, I'm a stranger in a strange land because I'm surrounded by Yankees fans. So. Uh, I, I would also say, you know, so much of what uh, Ambassador Burns said resonates with the editorial positions of America uh, recently, but also throughout that 75-year period that we were talking about. You know, the Catholic social teaching is something to offer in this conversation. You know, we have a, a rich body of teaching about, um, you know, what, how the various international national actors ought to go about making decisions of, uh, of, of, of war and peace. Um, you might be familiar with, with uh, the just war doctrine, which is an important part of uh, Catholic social teaching over the years. Um, it's been employed uh, from time to time. Uh, and, you know, that body of teaching, we're going to have to bring that out and dust it off 
uh, because it, it, it's needed. It's a, it's a really important resource for this kind of conversation we're having. Um, and we're also going to have to rethink some of that, I think. You know, the, the, the just war teaching, it presumes that most of the actors on the international stage are countries. Um, and that's, of course, as we learned on 9-11, not necessarily the case anymore. We live in a different world today. There are other forces at work, some uh, more powerful than many countries. Uh, so that's an important thing to think about. Ambassador Burns also mentioned the uh, COVID pandemic. And I wanted to bring your attention a piece that we published at America Magazine this week. Uh, you can find it at uh, americamagazine.org. It was an interview that our national correspondent, Mike O'Loughlin, conducted with uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci. You, I'm sure, know who <laughs> Dr. Fauci is. Uh, he's also a graduate of uh, Regis uh, High School here in New York and uh, the College of the Holy Cross in Massachusetts. Um, a very hugely distinguished career uh, in, in government service over the last 30 years. Has been central to the federal government's response to this pandemic in the United States. Uh, our national correspondent, Michael Auckland, uh, was able to to, to talk to him specifically about the question of how to how and whether to reopen our churches and to resume the uh, celebration of the mass. And as you know, that's a conversation that's going on right now. Um, and Dr. Fauci said uh, in that interview with uh, Michael Laughlin that some of it is going to depend on where you are in the country. I think we all know this. There are some parts of the country that have been harder hit than others. Um, but he said, as a general rule, uh, it's probably not the right time to uh, resume large liturgical celebrations and the distribution of communion. Um, that's hard to hear for those of us who, who love the Eucharist and love being together in, in worship. Uh, but, you know, he's making his judgment as a public health expert. You're, I would encourage you to go and, and read that interview, uh, if you haven't already, and, uh, and leave your comments there. Uh, at americanmagazine.org. It's a really interesting conversation. You can agree or disagree with uh, Dr. Fauci, um, but it's a really important conversation. It's important from a public health point of view, but it also, I think, reveals the value of these sacraments, the value of community uh, to us as Catholics, right? Um, if, if we follow Dr. Fauci's advice, uh, we're gonna, we, we're, we are going to pay some price for it. Uh, we might be safe in the physical sense, but, uh, you know, it, it, there's a kind of spiritual poverty that I think we've all experienced over the last several months. And that's an important, that is an important thing to bear in mind, to reflect on, you know, there, we've sensed an absence of the real presence and that has not been easy. Uh, it's important to acknowledge that pain and to confront it. Really interesting conversation happening on our website about that article. Um, and I just wanted to get to a couple of these comments because I thought that they were interesting. Uh, you know, a number of people commented on how watching priests in the parish celebrate mass uh, or distribute the host uh, without a, a, a mask uh, is, is jarring. It's unsettling. And uh, this person certainly believes that it's a mistake. Um, and the rationale is that, you know, some need to see the celebrant's lips in, an, uh, in addition to hearing the words those lips utter. But this person writes, we are not out of the woods yet with this pandemic, and we have a local parish uh, that lost an elderly priest and four others fell ill in, uh, to this virus uh, in just the last several weeks. Uh, that came from uh, Helene. So Helene, thank you for offering your comments there. Another author wrote uh, that some uh, well commented on that part of the story uh, where the the uh, where Michael Lachlan said that some dioceses are even permitting Catholics to continue receiving the host on the tongue right now. Um, uh, but this this uh, reader noted that that is inaccurate. Uh, dioceses and bishops do not have authority to deny or permit receiving on the tongue. Uh, so while some claim to permit or deny one way of receiving communion, their claims are incorrect and illegitimate. Um, I'm not sure that that's entirely accurate. 
uh, but thank you, Luke, for making uh, that comment and for reading America. Uh, I think, uh, I'm not a thousand percent convinced of this either, but I do believe that in, in canon law, a bishop uh, has the authority by virtue of his office to suspend uh, certain parts of canon law uh, in an emergency. And that's probably the part of canon law that they are relying on to make these decisions. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, canon law is the body of rules and regulations that the church uses to exercise its uh, ministry uh, from day to day, kind of an, uh, an operation manual for, uh, for the life of the church. I also want to draw to your attention to uh, another piece. You know, we have all been following, I think, the, the news from Minneapolis. Um, and Archbishop uh, B Bernard uh, Hebda uh, released a statement uh, about the events in, in Minneapolis um, and what, uh, well, the, the expressed his sympathy for George Floyd, the, the man who was killed uh, in this incident, um, and his solidarity with the people of the archdiocese and the, the city of Minneapolis as it grapples with this issue and all of it, all of the fallout from it. Uh, it's a heart-wrenching story. And, uh, but I just wanted to draw your attention to the statement that the Archbishop has made there. Um, he called the video gut-wrenching. Um, he urges a respect for, for all people, uh, an end to the uh, violence in the streets. Agree, disagree, but I just wanted you to see that, um, that the Archbishop there has responded. And if you want to join the conversation, uh, when you check out that article, do leave your comments or questions uh, down at the bottom of the page, because next week I will come back to them. And uh, as we did today, talk a little bit about uh, what your take is on what is happening there. I suspect that this is a story we're going to be talking a lot about uh, over the next few weeks. And, you know, if anything positive can come out of such a horrific event, uh, one hopes at least that it will prompt a national dialogue on these issues of, uh, of race, which continue, uh, you know, racism is the besetting sin of the American experience. And uh, they can, these issues continue to uh, accompany us. And uh, it's at moments like this, we have to listen uh, to be open to our neighbors, to our fellow human beings um, in, a, in a spirit of generosity. Um, and we also have to call out uh, the moral dimension of these issues and say that what is wrong is wrong um, and what is right is right. Racism is a sin, uh, whether it's systemic or it's personal, uh, it is a sin. And so we are called to witness to that teaching of the church. I want to thank Ambassador Burns for being a part of this conversation today. My apologies for the fact that it started a little later than we expected due to some technical difficulties. We're going to make sure to fix those in the future. Uh, I invite you to come back next Friday because uh, here uh, at noon in this live stream, we're going to be talking to Sister Carol Kean, who is the former president of the Catholic Health Association. And she's going to be speaking about how the current COVID-19 crisis can, can or could reshape uh, American health care, the, the system, really. Uh, and please don't forget to follow us on uh, social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, for more videos from America. And to subscribe to America, you can go to americamagazine.org uh, or you can text the word subscribe to 833-JESUITS for your smart Catholic take on faith and culture. My thanks again for watching and God bless you. Have a great week.